The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxing. All right, we are here in beautiful, sunny Santa Barbara, and we are here at the home of none other than 1977 world champion and WSL founder, Sean Thompson. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and thanks so much for inviting me up to do it in person. I haven't done too many in person lately. No, thanks, Dave. Great that uh, you came up, and um, I've been a massive supporter of uh, pro surfing uh, since uh, a group of us guys helped make it all happen starting with the IPS and then um, the ASP and now uh, the WSL. So, so anything I can do to perhaps, um, you know, give a little bit of background um, on perhaps how it started and, and, and where it's been and where it's going. Absolutely. And we're going to get into to all of that. But you are uh, inarguably one of South Africa's I'll, I'll leave the surfing adjective out of it, just South Africa's greatest exports. But you've been living in Santa Barbara for, for quite some time. How long have you been up here for? So we moved here in 1995. Uh, I moved here to actually work for Patagonia. I worked for them for a couple of years. They hired me uh, to manage their apparel division, which was the biggest division at the time. And I'd been here in the late 70s. Uh, I became very friendly with Al Merrick. Uh, Al used to make my boards uh, for many years. And I just fell in love with the area. Uh, I fell in love with Rincon, and I fell in love with uh, Santa Barbara and um, all the spots north. So, uh, in fact, you know, thinking about it, I was at school in uh, in, in South Africa, and uh, we were just starting to learn trigonometry. Mm. I think I was in, uh, it was called, uh, at the time, it was called Standard 6. So it was like, I don't know, grade perhaps grade eight. And um, we used to have a little box and in the box was contained the protractor and the, you know, all the different ruler and all the different things for, for, for trig. Uh, and I remember I found this picture in Surfer magazine of Hammond's Reef with this guy locked, in those days he used to call it locked in, locked into the locked into the tube, and, and I, I cut the picture out and I put it on my pencil box. So every day when I do mathematics, I'd open this box and I'd see this picture of, of Montecito, Santa Barbara, and it was always my dream to one day go there. And one day I went there and I, eventually I moved there. I love it. And, and I was going to ask you about that too because uh, we ended up in obviously different trajectories, but I grew up in Australia and then Orange County and then went to school up here at UCSB. And I had zero sort of ge geographical sense in terms of swell direction. I think I packed a 610 and thought I'll probably be surfing, you know, several feet overhead ring con multiple times a week. I'll use this quite a lot and hadn't realized how unique the geography is in Santa Barbara where it's south facing and the Channel Islands block all the south swell. And even that steep angled north swell doesn't quite get in there. It has to be very west. And it's a unique place because it feels like when there are waves, the waves are so, so good but probably compared to where you grew up in Durban and spent most of your life, the consistency is not there. Was that a hard thing for you when you moved to Santa Barbara, not being able to surf every day or around every kind of season? Yeah, I think it was a bit of an adjustment, uh, especially the, the the temperature of the water. Where I grew up, it was subtropics, mm -hmm. Durban, 32 degrees latitude. So the water seldom dropped below uh, 74 degrees. Um, so that was a change, having to wear booties pretty much uh, – year round also the infre infrequency i mean i used to like to think that back in durban i could surf 365 mm -hmm. there was always some sort of wave uh, in the area that we grew up uh, bay of plenty and then later new pier north beach there was always seemed to be a wave and then there was a lot of waves north and south on the coast a lot of uncrowded surf so you had to adjust to the crowds um the inconsistency but i, I love this area it's a beautiful area this is where we, we raised our first son, um, Matthew. It's where we're raising our, our second son, Luke. So it's it's a very special community-based area. Uh, I think we have this really unusual um, 
sort of perspective and that we are face south facing. Mm. It's the only place in California that faces south behind us. We have the beautiful San Inez Mountains. Then we have this sort of little verdant area that we all live in in, in Santa Barbara. And then um, and then we've got the point breaks. When they break, they're perfect. <laughs> when they're not, they're invisible. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting too. I was talking to another Santa Barbara native, uh, Connor Coffin, um, pretty recently for an episode that's coming up. And we talked about the exact same thing. And because of the changes that have been made to the sport recently, he's been spending a lot more time at home. And and he was commenting on, you know, he said when I'm yet when I was younger, every day I had to surf. Like if I had to drive all the way to lowers, I would go just to surf every day. And he said, I'm still competing at the elite level and performing at an elite level. But he said, I've found that I can actually take a day or three days or a week off and I actually surf better. Um with that break, which it, it, he kind of alluded that it was related to maturity in a way where he said, you know, I actually feel like I'm surfing better, not having to surf every day. Now, that's interesting. I've always thought, um, I mean, my philosophy was in the water all the time, mm. not because it was a way to get better, not because it was a way to win comps. Uh, it was just what I, I love. I love to do, and I, I used to try to pack as much surfing in um, as I could. But then I had also throughout my career a lot of other stuff going on. I was at um, you know I was at uni- I went to university for a few years while I was on the pro tour. At the same time, uh, I started a few businesses. Uh, I started Instinct while I was competing. So I think if if surfing is the only thing that you're focusing on, I think I think there could be that point of diminishing returns mm. uh, where kind of maybe the more you are in the water, the less you're getting, it out, getting out of it in terms of improvement. Um, but for me, I mean, I know when I was on the tour, there was no one in the world that surfed as much as I did. And like I say, it wasn't, it wasn't to be better or to practice, just I loved it. I loved surfing and junk i love surfing and perfect surf i love surfing and small surf i love surfing and big surf i just love that feeling I, I think i was the most stoked person on the planet and i'm still i'm still pretty stoked but not uh i, I, I don't have that obsession uh, that i used to but i still love it and i'm still stoked So our episode right now is going to air in and around the start of the window for the Corona Open J-Bay. That event's going to start its uh, event window on July 12th and um, knock on wood somewhere. But the forecast right now looks pretty good. You know, according to Surfline, we've got four to six feet on the 12th. We've got 10 to 15 feet on the 13th and the 14th. And we've got eight to 12 feet on the uh, 15th and then another swell backing that up. Um, you know, as someone who in many, many ways put Jeffrey's Bay on the map, certainly with your performances in the 70s and the 80s, seeing the world's best surfing come back there in 2022, it must hold a pretty special place in your heart. Yeah, I think it's so exciting to have um, the guys at J-Bay after such a sort of such a long layoff. I just happened to be there um, the year, a few years back, uh, I don't know whether it was eight or nine when Philippe Toledo mm. had that amazing 10 point ride. And I was standing there in the competitors area. I was doing some color commentary for the WSL and, and I just happened to be standing there with all the competitors. I was standing right next to Owen Wright, who's a tremendous surfer. And let me tell you, when he bust out a series of, um, of aerials, it, it was just uh, incredible because it was a Southwesterly, the wind was blowing down the line. It wasn't like the wind was blowing into the face. And it was so, it was such a creative, a new creative view of how you could surf J-Bay because J-Bay was about the car mm. and the tube. Yeah, That was how J-Bay was surfed and that, that's how I surfed it from when I first went there in 1968 all the way uh, you know, through the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, it was about the tube and the car. But now you had Philippe busting a 10 with those incredibly um, creative and I think functional is It wasn't like the whole wave was a change rail, change rail, change rail, boom, change rail, right. change rail. Change rail. You know, his carving was incredible. 
Um, so it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, uh, to beat him. Mm. He's just so, so good on the face at that spot. I mean, I think Jordy, I love the way Jordy Smith surfs at J-Bay and Jordy's had a pretty tough time on the tour this year in terms of, of results. I mean, I think he's still surfing at a, at a really high level from what I've seen a, a, as an outsider. Um, but I think his surfing is so well suited suited to that wave. I, rem- I remember when uh, the first year Geordie got on the tour, and it must have been 2005, I think, and uh, his dad used to work for my dad. My dad got Geordie Smith's dad, Graham, into the business. Uh, he had a shop, my dad, Sean Thompson Surfboards, and, and Graham, uh, before he started shaping uh, – you know, laminated spray glass. He was a really amazing craftsman. Um, anyway, when I met Jordy, as he was sort of coming on, and I watched him surf, and his surfing was just was was mind blowing. <laughs> I walked into his apartment. I think I was I was writing a little story on him, and he had like thirty boards from all the best shapers in the world, and. Uh, I went, wow, Jordy, man, how, how are you doing this? So many shapers, so much confusion. I said, you need to pick one guy. I said, all the best surfers in the world. Since time immemorial, since the creation of uh, pro surfing and the tour in 1976, have really had one foundational shaper that they work with. Sure, you know, people might experiment a little bit, but, but you've got to have the foundational shaper. The surfer-shaper relationship, it's almost like a – uh, like a um, uh, psychologist or psychiatrist and patient or uh, father-son mm. uh, relationship. Um, and he had so many, and, and I thought, Jordy, it's just like really, really confusing. You know, just pick the guy. I mean, you look at Kelly Slater with Al Merrick. You look mm. at Tom Curran with Al Merrick. You look at um, Tom Carroll with Phil Byrne. Uh, I know myself with Spider Murphy, and then later in my career with uh, with uh, Al Merrick, Rusty. Um, you need to have that. You see what what happens, and um, even the greatest of all time. You know, you've seen it with Kelly. I think since Kelly left. Al, I think he's only won one event mm. on a different type of board. And this is how attuned a surfer becomes to equipment. It doesn't mean that the equipment that Kelly's riding post Channel Islands is inferior. It just means it's different. And in a competitive situation, you need to have that absolutely stable base to form your confidence and commitment around. It's very diff- difficult to, to surf at your absolute peak and beyond when there is that part of your body, which is what your board becomes, that is a teeny, teeny one millimeter. Uh, 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 it's, it's not finely tuned in. It's not that that absolute um, connective relationship. Because mm. you, you, you've got to have that connective relationship. And you'll see, you know, when you look at Italo and you look at uh, Gabriel, you look at Philippe, the Brazilian guys, I mean, they got it down. They got mm. their shapers and that's it. Mm. They have really, I think, looked um, to where the success has been and followed that path. Yes, they've taken their, their, their own particular paths, but that surface shape of relationship is, um, cannot be uh, overstated. I mean, look at McFanning. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think all the guys in recent times that have, uh, have been very, very successful, they're, they're, they've had that, um, that sort of long-term relationship. Yeah, even if you look at someone like a, a Steph Gilmore in DH or a Chris Amore in Mayhem. Yeah. Like, it's interesting too because it's something I'm fascinated by as well. And I mean, Jordy was on Channel Islands for a number of years and I think he went to JS. I think he was getting boards from Chris Gallagher and then he was um, working with his dad's label for a period of time. I think recently he's, he's hopped on the Pattersons. 
But it's interesting because I, 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 I love getting your insight on the surfer shaper relationship because it does seem like people fall into two camps. They either kind of go with what works for them or they have kind of this period of um, polyamorous relationships with shapers where they're all going to try a bunch of different things. And you can look at someone like a Jack Robinson who was doing that probably for the last few years. And I think just this last week he announced that he signed sort of almost exclusively with Sharp Eye um, because that seems like it's working for him. Um, but it does feel like, you know, when, when results are not happening for the surfers, you know, everyone's looking for a reason why not. And you look at surfers kind of toying with their equipment sometimes and, and sort of a lemming culture where they go like, what's that guy riding? What's that guy, that guy's getting the result. Did that happen a lot when you were on tour as well? Or were, were people kind of in their own lane in terms of equipment? I think you have to try and experiment. Certainly, mm. uh, I remember I, I counted up the number of shapers that I worked with throughout my career. Okay, I had pri my primary shapers, but certainly I would, if something new came out and if like I watched a guy surf and went, wow, there's certainly a fundamental appreciation and where he was before the board and where he was with this new board, I've got to try, I've got to see what's happening there. Is it, you know, is there something in that board that, that, that I could use? And I worked with 34 different guys throughout my career. So I'm, I have worked with more shapers than any other pro in the history of the sport. Even though I understand the importance of having the, that, that very, very close relationship with your primary shapers, you still have to do the experimentation. You still have to, to, to try what's hot. I mean, today it's, it's, I think it's a lot more of a closed shop. Mm. You know, it's like a fundamental decision. If you're going to be moving to, to another guy, uh, or you're going to be trying another board, it's like a, a big deal. But, but back then, oh, you know, Damien Hardman is just like backside attack, mind blowing. L let me try a Greg, a Greg Clough. Let me see what he's got. Uh, let me uh, try something from Gary Linden. Mm. Let, let me try something uh, from Bill Barnfield. Let me try something from Tom Parrish. Uh, let me try something from Rusty L. Let me try something from Nev Harmon. Uh, you, you know what I mean? I would always keep my mind open and I think, that's important, but you need to have that super close relationship so that the shaper knows, I think, what you're all about. And I've had long discussions with him, with Matt Biolos and Timmy Patterson. It's, there is this, um, I think, part of having a strong relationship is, is the confidence, is the confidence that it can uh, bring to you. I mean, certainly you mentioned Carissa and um, you mentioned uh, Steph. These, you know, every surf, I'll tell you what, every pro is looking for that magic board. We are all, it's that like the holy grail, that magic board. And you can go through a whole career and have maybe five or six magic boards. Magic boards uh, were hard to come by in my career. I, I don't know, today, you know, with the exact replication, Still, it's 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 still difficult to to find the magic, and with that magic, you got the power, man. You got the power to bust down the doors, to win, to be a champion. It just gives you that extra. I think it gives you that extra juice. I'd imagine too that uh, certainly in the '70s and '80s, you guys and your contemporaries, you were advancing the approach to wave riding so fast, almost to singularity levels to where people couldn't keep up. And I'd imagine that design philosophy on the board side of things was moving very quickly too. So, so moving around and trying different things was almost essential, you know, coming in the seventies and eighties compared to now where it does seem like people still are, 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 are moving through design theory and trying new technologies, trying new fin setups, et cetera. But as you pointed out, everything's become so it's easier to replicate, right, with the CDC machines and everything. Yeah, but I think I still think that uh, you know, wild experimentation is um, is like vitally important uh, mm. to the sport. I mean, even in the uh, you know through the period when Kelly came on, I mean, Kelly has been an unbelievable designer. You know, he was working with L and super narrow, flipped up noses, minimal volume, and then. Uh, you know, everyone kind of followed that path. And then the, the board started to go shorter. I remember him turning up and blowing mines uh, with a five, I think it was a five eight at, um, at uh, Durambo at one of the events. And it was like, everywhere, what's Kelly riding now? Wow, he's gone. 
way too short. And, and now boards are way shorter than they used to be. Um, boards are straighter now. Right. Uh, boards have more volume, wider points a little bit f- up. So people have realized that, that that volume is a friend. You know, when you look at the sticks that uh, Gabriel is riding, certainly straighter, more volume. You look at, <clears throat> you look what John John's riding. Mm. And I think that that volume and the way they're using volume now with the straighter, straighter rocker, still single to double, concaves. Um, I think it's done two things. It's um, made the carving a lot better because guys are running out their calves now for much further on the face. They're not as compact and tight. And I, I've always thought like the true test of a surface, the carve, man. You've got to, you've got to have the carve down. Yeah, tube riding is unbelievable and aerial is unbelievable. But you've got to have that pure, uh, pure carve. Um, so I think boards have really designed themselves around that philosophy. And it's wonderful to see that you know, people thought, ah, oh, surfing was pro surfing is going to be trickster stuff, you know, mm. uh, air reverses. And, but it, but it hasn't, hasn't gone that way. There's still those three fundamental components to getting a 10. I mean, obviously the tube, but the carve is right there with, um, with the airs. And a guy can still, just on carves in small beach break waves, can get a, a 9.8. Yep. Okay, if there's an unbelievable air, Philippe can throw up an unbelievable air like in the, uh, the last event in Brazil and get a, a 10. But I would see see guys just on carving, you know, get nine sixes and nine fives. So the carve is important and the judges are rewarding that purity and that art form. It does. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up too because it does feel, if you look over the course of the last 15, 20 years, there were a lot more specializations maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Like you had your aerial series and your aerial guys and you had kind of your tube riders and you had your, your sort of pure power surfers. And it does feel that on the men's and women's tours these days, everything is sort of um, progressed to the point where you, you have to kind of be able to do everything if you're going to be a world title contender, which is really cool from my perspective because the product is designed to be the best surfing in the world in the live arena. And I, and I feel like it's actually gotten there a lot closer than it was maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, I think the surfers are incredibly complete mm. in in all in in all those three aspects: tube riding, carving. Is I remember years ago. I, I don't know why. I'm trying to think why I was in Brazil. Or maybe I was watching one of the first. Um, first webcast and it was a, an event i think it was the first event that jets and andre won oh yeah that was uh 2010 santa catarina it was 2010 2010 i think wow, yeah, I, yeah. I, I thought it was i thought it was a lot earlier than that but anyway he was doing these air reverses at will which was like mind blowing yes and i went wow how can how can you compete against that he's got this mind blowing maneuver that that no one else can do and then everyone sort of caught up and the perception was well that's just one aspect it's not the only aspect so so i love the way that you know in the context of competition that there's still this unbelievable amount of creativity in surfing and and, and i'm looking at it strictly now from a fan perspective okay i have a since i've been doing it for longer than most people on this planet i i, I mean I, maybe i have a, a Sort of a not a deeper appreciation, but I mean, I, I have I have an appreciation for the for the level of difficulty and and the level of risk because every single time someone punts five feet above the lip, man, that's potential end of, end of your career right there. So the the courage uh, and and the commitment there is is like unbelievable. Is I mean, it is so for me, it's breathtaking. I just love to see these young guys just blast. Above the lip, and I was never, you know, I was never an aerial guy, but I have such an appreciation for the for the level of difficulty and the level of risk, man. The mm. risk is, it's it's just so 
profound, man. It's an existential risk. Every time a guy boosts it up there, I go, whoa, hopefully this guy's going to come down. You know, sometimes you see them landing on the flats and I'm going, wow, the pressure and the force that's being exerted on knees and ankles and hips. <laughs> Bringing it back to the wave at Jeffrey's Bay, we, we talked about it. it looks like we have an amazing forecast for the event, fingers crossed. In the past, people have said the wave at Jeffrey's Bay, there's nowhere to hide in that you're completely exposed as a surfer in terms of your technical ability, your ability to read a wave, your ability to flow. Do you agree with that assessment in terms of vulnerability on the wave? Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I don't know, 25 years ago, I said, j is an easy wave to ride. It's a hard wave to ride well, man. It's It does, it reveals all your... Um, all your inadequacies. <laughs> it reveals someone who understands the complete canvas, who understands that surfing is not just about that one aerial maneuver, that surfing is about the flow between the maneuvers as importantly as it is between the tube rod, the air and the carb. You have to have that, that flow, that rhythm, that connectivity with the wave. And you see the best guys have that amazing connectivity. I mean, when I think about how many incredible waves I've watched of, of Kelly Slater out there, he certainly has that um, connectivity to the wave and the, the understanding of the entire path. He understands the curve of that wave. Um, and when I think about the great guys that I've seen there in the past, um, Jonathan Parman, who is maybe the greatest South African surfer uh, until Geordie at J-Bay. The way Geordie rides it with those massive power surges. It's like on some days I watch him, it's like he's driving a Ferrari and everyone else is in a v -dub. Um, Then, of course, you know, Curran, Oki, someone that not a lot of people uh, know who was incredible there was Tom Carroll. Mm. I mean, he was just sensational. I spent a few weeks with Tom down there in 82, and we just had a run of surf. Sometimes just Tom and me in the water. It was just... He, he was really, um, really incredible uh, to watch. Joel was magnificent uh, at Jeffries, as was McFanning. Um, and then I think today, uh, you know, Philippe has uh, taken it sort of to the next level there. It's going to be interesting to see how Jack, Jack Robinson surfs mm -hmm. there. Um I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to be intrigued to see, to see how he surfs there. He seems like one of those guys that, uh, we're not the first people to talk about it, but has really entered the championship tour with a good amount of humility in his own surfing and, and worked on parts of his surfing that, that maybe he wasn't as strong at, right? I think everyone's like, oh, it's at the box or North Point or Chopu or Pipe or, or any of these spots, he's going to be incredible. And not that he wasn't incredible in other aspects of his surfing, but it seems like he's been very intentionally focused on how do I surf point breaks? How do I develop that carve? How do I develop that flow? How do I work on my equipment? How do I lift my aerial game in a way that's going to be competitive in the live arena? I've, I've been really impressed just by his psychology since he's joined the championship tour. Yeah, I think he's had tremendous improvement um, and growth. So it's going to be interesting to see um, where he goes at J-Bay. You know, it's interesting when I look at the difference between Philippe and Jack Robinson. Um, most world champions, most guys that that change, change the trajectory of, of surfing, they have this commitment and power in waves of consequence at part, but Chirpu today. Um, but certainly 
pop and sunset. You know, they're the North Shore, man. You had to be a master. You had to be a dominator of that of that radical surf. And 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 Jack's been, you know, that way since he he he, he we first started hearing about him. Just in the same way that, you know, Kelly came from tiny ways, but he do, he, he dominated the Andy Irons. Okay, Andy Irons grew up in that uh, kind of stuff. And uh, if there's sort of that 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 weak link. Or that chink in uh, uh, Philippe's armor. Perhaps it's having that commitment in in gnarly surf, but that's something you can learn. You know what I mean? Mm. In, in the same way that a, a guy who's an amazing surfer um, can learn how to compete and learn how to be successful, a guy can learn about courage and commitment if he wants it, mm. if he has the desire, if he has the mojo, if he has the purpose. If he has the fire, um, and uh, I mean, I loved what Adriana de Souza did with Jamie O'Brien so many years ago. Like he went to Jamie and said, "Jamie, you knocked on that door, humble." Talk about humility. Of course, knocked on that door and said, "Hey, um, I need help." And and uh, you know, perhaps Philippe you know, might might want to consider like who, as an outside source, can help him to paddle over that edge of pipeline when it's 12 feet and it's low tide with absolute commitment and knowledge that I'm going, I'm going. We mentioned that you um, grew up in Durban, but do you remember the first time you went to Jeffrey's Bay? Yeah, the first time I went to J-Bay in 1968, it was my first surfing safari. Uh, my dad had, a, had this like cheap wagoneer there was uh, myself, my cousin, Mark, who was a year older than me, my brother, Paul, who was two years younger than me, and then this amazing surfer uh, called Jeremy Yates. The four of us were in the back of the wagon here. We had our V-bottoms. Uh, the shortboard revolution had just hit South Africa a few months before, so we'd gone from like Nano down to, uh, I had like a 5.6. <laughs> sounds uh, pretty radical. Yeah, so it was like a radical change. We had these like radical V-bottoms. And uh, we drove 650 miles down to J-Bay with my dad. And we'd seen movies of, of Jeffrey's and like, oh, it's going to be our first safari. And we, we came to the local hotel. We arrived there in the evening and we, we asked, like, how do we get down to the point in the next morning? And they told us and we drove down to the point. This is one of the greatest memories of my entire surfing life. So now... We drive down to the point, find our way to the point in the morning, and the sun's rising because Jeffrey's on the east coast, so the sun rises up through the ocean there, this blood-red African orb. And we walk down to the beach, and it's perfection. Four to six feet, the best waves we've ever seen in our lives. The best waves we've ever seen in our lives. And we immediately jump out there, and it's just the three of us. Uh, we paddle out there. It was a little bit big for my brother that day. So it's Jeremy, Michael, and I. We paddle out there towards that beautiful African sun to these perfect waves, and we have it to ourselves for a couple of hours. It was such, such an amazing moment. And I think I, I, I heard or I'd read that when you first started surfing Jeffrey's Bay, because there's multiple sections of Jeffrey's Bay. And did you guys start up at, at the point or at Supers or down at the Boneyard? Like, well, because I think it was also, I think I'd heard you mention it was at a time before there were leg ropes as well. So it was kind of like, well, oh, yeah. we're going to start over here instead. There was no, no leg ropes. I mean, leg ropes were only invented in 1971. So we used to surf an area called the Point. Yep. Um, and then at, at, at Jeffrey's, I suppose there's four, five breaks. I mean, the, the northernmost part is the point and that's what we all thought was the perfect wave yeah, yeah. Um, and we're riding these sort of clunky v bottoms and as surfing progressed um, by the end of 1968 guys had started to ride um, the next most southern break and it was called tubes so it's a separate little wave fast and hollow very close to the reef and we were like freaked out because you know the muscles there are sharp and <laughs> and uh, we then in december so we're just wearing board shorts and and we started riding tubes uh we didn't start riding people had cape town guys and 
had started writing it before us. And then um, by uh, 69, late 69, um, early, early 70, they started writing at Super Tubes, which was the, you know, the main breaks. You got Super Tubes and then Boneyards. But that break really only started to be uh, written in, in 1970. Um, and it was really the, the first, the, the, the top gun there from South Africa then, I would say, was, uh, was Gavin Rudolph. Mm. Um, just, just an amazing, uh, amazing surfer. But after the world contest that was held at Johanna, um, in 1970, uh, that was May. So by June, Nat Young, uh, Ted Spencer, and Wayne Lynch came and rode Jeb they rode supers uh, on the Kielfin boards. They had these keel, like Kielfin single fins, kind of down railers based off Rolf Arnesa's boards. They'd gone from riding these super, super stubbies to these um, really interesting Kielfin boards. And I remember watching them. It was like six to eight feet, and I was like, 13 years old and uh, going, wow, it's so radical to watch these guys surf on this, right on the rocks at Supers, no leashes. Um, and that was sort of, I think, the sessions that really opened the floodgates to Jay Beck. I, I, I love that story because I think it's a, you know, it's almost a microcosm of so much that's happened in your life in the sense of like, I really consider you and your contemporaries you know, akin to, you know, world explorers or pioneers because you, you're innovating things that, or exploring things that never happened before. And, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. We're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to dig more into where Sean Thompson came from. Be right back. All right. So, uh, we talked a little bit before, uh, born and raised in Durban. What was it like? What, what was your family like growing up? Mom, what did mom and dad do? You mentioned a younger brother, Paul. What was your, what was your childhood like? So there was three of us in our family. Uh, my sister Tracy, who was like a year behind me. Uh, my brother Paul, who was two years behind me. Um, and me, my parents got divorced when we were about 10 years old. Um, so we primarily lived with uh, our mom all the weekends. Uh, we stayed with my dad. My dad lived right, right by the beach, right across the road from the beach. Uh, and my dad was surf crazy. Loved surfing, loved surfers, loved helping surfers. You know, if there was a poor surfer on the beach, he needed a board. My dad just buy him a board. If he needed clothes to go somewhere, he'd buy him clothes. And he, he would never like make a big deal out of it. He just loved helping, helping young people and loved the, loved the sport of, of, of surfing. He'd been a great athlete in his youth. Um, his dream was to go to the 1948 Olympics, uh, but he was very badly attacked by a shark while he was surfing. I think his first, recorded incident in South Africa of a, of a shark attack on a surfer. Mm. Um, so it ripped up his right arm, nearly killed him, but he survived. Um, and then uh, he went to San Francisco to, re to have a, a big uh, arm operation. And then they sent him over to Hawaii to recuperate. So his swimming hero when he was young was Duke Hanamoku, who became my hero as well. And uh, when he was recuperating, he stayed in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel right on the beach. There was just two hotels on the beach in Waikiki, then the Moana and the Royal. And he stayed there and he, he fell in with all the Kahanamoku guys. And, and I think he had just this wonderful affection for Hawaii from thereafter. And, and the love of you know Hawaiian culture, I think we were the only – house in South Africa where you had to take your shoes off to go inside. You had to leave your <laughs> shoes outside. Uh, so he loved surfing. He he managed to retire at a, at a young age. Uh, he he was in the, um, him and his brother had the, the biggest like metal works uh, uh, body shop in the, in the, in the, in the town and owned property and then sold it and, and then retired and then um, just sort of lived a, lived a good life. But, pick me up from school, yeah, only if the surf was good. He'd pick me up and my brother up and pick my cousin up who was at a different school and we'd take us surfing. 
but only if it was good. If the wind we could see in the morning, oh, it's going to be a southwest wind. Okay, my dad will be there to pick us up. Otherwise, we'd have to catch the bus home. <laughs> my mom worked her whole life. I lost my mom last year. She was just an amazing woman. And she grew up in the Second World War on the island of Malta, which was the most heavily bombed place in the history of the world. She endured 3,600 air raids, two direct hits, lived in underground shelters for a number of years, and was eventually evacuated with most of the English people. They were being bombed by the Nazis and the Italians, uh, and ended up in, in, in South Africa and uh, fell in love with it, and then uh, met my dad, and uh, they they uh, had us, and they maintained um, an amicable relationship throughout their um, throughout their lives. My dad remarried, re remarried a wonderful American woman, um, Eve, um, and uh, my dad just loved traveling, loved the good life. We would every single school holidays we go on a surfing trip somewhere down the coast to Jeffrey's Bay and. You know, we'd always stay in great hotels and, and, and he, he loved life. He loved surfing and was instrumental in uh, helping create pro surfing in South Africa. I mean, he was one of the originators of the, the first world's first professional surfing contest, uh, which became the Gunston 500. It was called the Durban 500. It was the first pro surf contest in the world, the first surfing contest to offer prize money. It offered 500 rand at the time and it was won by... Um, by Gavin Rudolph. So, um, you know, he, he was involved in, in surfing throughout his life, loved it, uh, gave a tremendous amount of, of his life back to surfing. He was a judge in the 1970 World Championships. He, I remember him judging the final, uh, the one that Rolf Arnest won. So he really gave back, and I think he taught me and my mom, you know, about hope about optimism, mm. about faith and and, and, and and giving back and being nice and humble to people. You know, my dad used to say to me, hey, winning's easy. When you win, win like a gentleman. When mm. you lose, lose like a man. And and this was not meant in a, in a sort of anti-feminist way at all because, you know, he's really incredibly respectful of, of the growth of, of, of women's pro surfing too, but he, uh, he, he was a man of, uh, taught me about honor, taught me about, mm. about integrity. So that's the culture that I grew up in. We grew up you know, around the beach spending you know, every waking moment uh, down at the beach, surfing and competing it was important, but I played rugby, I played cricket, played tennis, I was a swimming captain at school. So you know, I played all the other sports, um, expected to go to university and become a professional person. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be a pro surfer. <laughs> so uh, I was, you know, I was at university and competing at the same time uh, for the first few years of uh, of, uh, of university, and uh, it was a it was a great existence. Yes, I grew up in an apartheid society in a segregated society, um, but you know, at the time living in that, it's not until you travel that you realize the injustice. Right. And certainly um, throughout my career and, 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 and thereafter, I really ha have really felt it as a personal obligation to help underprivileged, to help people who um, uh, might not be as, as fortunate and, and to realize that, that you know, the life that, that, that we lived when we were growing up was a privileged life and certainly privileged uh, you know, at the expense of, of a huge chunk of the South African uh, uh, population. But living in that society doesn't mean you're going to be a racist. You make your own choices. You make your own decisions um, as to moral responsibility, who you are as a person, how you uh, treat others. And um, I think we came from a very liberal household, uh, from a house household that was very uh, very respectful of others. It, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so much to unpack there, but but I, one of the things that you just touched on there at the end is uh, makes me think of uh, the perspective or broadening perspectives in a way. And um, you know, I, I, I to, to draw a comp, like I I think surfing for me as an Orange County suburban kid, it was like oh, this is a window to like 
different things you know like surfing was great it was fun it was super awesome but it's like oh, i could travel or i could read about travel i could read about different people and cultures and it was this perspective broadening exercise you know and it sounds like what your dad was able to do with you is is broaden that perspective through travel a lot as well um and as you said it kind of it, it gives you insight into how other people live and how other cultures and it informs the way you kind of the lens through which you look at the world yeah very much so. i mean i went on my first international trip um when i was 14 my father took me to hawaii it was for my bar mitzvah present i'm jewish uh, which was an, was an amazing pre- prison. And, you know, we spent the whole winter, maybe the, one of the biggest winters ever to hit uh, Hawaii. And we stayed at Macau and, you know, Greg Noll rode the, that, that, that massive wave. So, I mean, I started traveling at, um, at a very young age and definitely it does uh, broaden your perspective. And, and like I say, you know, my dad just loved Hawaii. I mean, he invited Eddie Aikau out to compete in the Gunston 500, which by then had become one of South Africa's biggest sporting events. And Eddie came to, to South Africa, came to Durban, to my hometown. And uh, they, were, they were scheduled to stay at the Malibu Hotel. And some racist manager said, no, you, you can't stay here. Mm. Uh, you, you're not white. So my dad freaked out, heard about this, and we went down and we – we, we grabbed Eddie and Eddie came and stayed with us. Um, and, you know, I would, I would take Eddie surfing. And I think that was the first time that I really realized, wow, I'm looking at the world through Eddie's lens, through his mm. perspective. Um, and that was a real um, wake-up call for like a 15 or 16-year-old uh, kid. And, and I think Eddie was always... Um, uh, I think always grateful for that aloha that the the Thompson family, and then we introduced him to the Holmes family, to uh, to Lynn and Daryl Holmes, and they took him to Jeffrey's Bay, and he he always had this kinship with South Africans and with Australians too. Mm. There was a special bond because of I think the the hand that they stretched out um, uh, out uh, to him just you know, the love of one surfer for another. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of the, uh, the activities you did growing up and how the, the family expectation for you is to go to university, become a <laughs> professional person, as you put it. And, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before the break is, is you guys, you were part of a generation that invented something that didn't exist before. I mean, obviously there were surfing competitions, but surfing as a profession was, I can't imagine that was, front of mind if if on your mind at all when you were developing as a young surfer in South Africa? No, not at all. I mean, I had no idea it was vaguely possible to make a living from going surfing. And like we did invent it as we went along and there was a number of, there were many people involved in the creation of the sport, people in South Africa, people in Australia, people in Hawaii, Fred Hemmings, Randy Rarick, Peter Benes, my father from South Africa, uh, you know Graham Cassidy, um, and then the uh, then there were also the surfers. You know Ian Cairns, PT, Mark Thompson, uh, Mark Richards, Rabbit, um, myself, and then the sort of the original guys making the big push out of uh, uh, Hawaii: Jeff Hackman, Reno, Michael Ho. Everyone played a, a greater or lesser extent in really uh, pushing it and 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 focusing. But it was wonderful to see how it. Um, it just developed from this sort of ragtag series of contests in different parts of the world to to something that is a legit, something that is um, that has uh, kind of a working economic model. Mm. You know, you have to have the economics have to work in order for it to be um, in order for it to be sustainable but underlying it all is that stoke man it's like today i went i went to my dermatologist she's fully stoked <laughs> she told me she said it's the first time i'd, I'd met her as a, a new a new doc sean i watch all the w cell events <laughs> she said i am so stoked 
to watch. And, and she'll know who's done well, who's doing well. So, yes, surfing will never be football, baseball, basketball, but I'm stoked. It's not going to be football, baseball, basketball. We have our own culture, we have our own vibe, and we have our own team of crazy enthusiasts. Our own, and it's not a team. Surfers don't have a team, they have a tribe. That's what Nat Young, I remember Nat Young writing that many, many years ago, the famous 1966 Australian uh, world champion. The surfers are a tribe, and, and, and certainly we are. We have our own customs, we have our own culture, we have our own code. Um, and I just love the way that it has developed. And I'll tell you one thing that, that, that I think people perhaps might have lost sight of. And this is one of the unbelievable powers of surfing and how WSL has managed to amplify that power. So I lost my son in 2006. My life changed. I went down a completely different path. I started writing books. I started, uh, I went back to grad school, did a master of science and leadership. I was fascinated by influence and inspiration, how people can influence and inspire others, how you can create a positive wave um, around the world. And so over the last, since I lost my boy, I really started in 2007. I speak at these conferences. I speak at the biggest companies in the world, Google, Cisco, Gap, Disney, the massive GM, massive companies. I speak, every time I do a, a paid speaking engagement, I do a free one. Hmm. Poor school, rehab clinic, prison, whatever. I, I often choose it. Sometimes I just ask the uh, corporate Give me a name of a of a school or university I'm to speak, and then I speak at the best universities. I was last week, two weeks ago, I was at uh, Kellogg Business School at Northwestern, the, the Master of Entrepreneurship at USC, the best schools in the world. And I, and I talk about the fundamental lessons surfing uh, can teach you about life. And I talk about this concept I've developed called the Code Method. Anyway, over the last two and a half years since COVID hit in February 20. Uh, and I had to transition my whole business uh, 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 virtual. Mm. I ask people, send me a word that describes how you're feeling. People text me a word and magically it just comes up on the screen. So if I have 2,000 people on the on the live stream, I can get 2,000 words in and it'll form a word cloud. So I can get an idea in a snapshot of how everyone's feeling. Okay, so the four big words over the period of the last two and a half years, have been, I call it a sad mindset, stress, anxiety, depression, disconnection. Disconnection is a big one. So now we have these millions and millions of people around the world. They know whew, 10 days, a 10 foot swell predicted at J-Bay. They all come online. They all get connected. They all get inspired. They get uplifted by pros, what they're doing in the water, and by what the WSL has created and what all of our surfers through the generations from 76 onward have also created. So for me, when I see this, man, I feel proud. Mm. I feel proud that I put my block in this amazing building in this, like a uh, temple, we built this temple of Stoke. Hmm. I think that's completely right. I mean, it, it it's beautifully put, and and I think it's one of those things too. And we we talk about it on inside the building a bit. Is developing just like human operating rhythms in a way where where you know football's got X amount of fans around the country, around the world, or whatever even if they don't watch every game, they generally understand, okay, the season starts in September, Super Bowl's in February, I got it, you know? And in surfing, what we've tried to do on the redesign the last couple of years is go, okay, whatever we're doing, can we create something that's gonna stand the test of time? So surf fans, as you pointed out, go, 
CT's back. It's starting at pipe. It's the end of January. Awesome. Something to look forward to, you know, or they've got oh, J-Bay. There's going to be swell coming at J-Bay in July. Oh, I'm psyched. You know, I've got this community of people. And um, yeah, I, I think it's beautifully put. I mean, you know, as an aside, you and I first met at, at, at in person at the end of 2006. That's when I started at the ASP. And I remember I had been sent to uh, Hawaii for the Triple Crown. And I remember getting a message from Rabbit, who was a contemporary of yours. He was our president at the time. And he said, uh, you know, Sean Thompson's going to be staying in your room for a few nights. And I thought, oh, my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> 1977 world champ Sean Thompson. And we'd spent a little bit of time talking then. It, it was obviously so fresh since you just yeah. lost your son. But it... it it made such an impact on me just getting to be next to you um, in a lot of ways. And, and, and even though it was a hard time for you, but watching what you've done since then and the trajectory you've been on has been incredible. You know, I ask a, a CT surfer this a lot um, or, or any surfer this a lot. And, and for you, I'm, I'm particularly interested because you developed into a world champion into a sport that didn't exist when you started surfing. Did you have a moment of, of sort of clarity where you thought, I'm going to do this. This is my, I'm going to be a professional surfer. I'm, I'm that good. Or was it more of an incremental thing for you where you're like, I'm winning these events and I'm winning those events and this nebulous kind of circuits forming and, and I could do this. So I'm, I'm curious if it was a gradual thing or if it was like a, there's a moment where it hit me. You know, it was sort of fits and starts. Mm. Um, like I remember 1975, end of the season, Rabbit and I had a, it had a great season on the North Shore. We were like the, you know, we were the top two guns on the North Shore. I'd won the Pop Masters. Um, and I was due to go back to university the next year because university, our university break was sort of November to January. So it fitted in perfectly with the, with the Hawaiian season. And we were standing on the beach, Rabbit and I, watching these like massive sets come through at Bansai Pipeline. No one out, 12 to 15. And we were like waxing up, getting ready to go out. And I said to Rabbit, I said, hey, hey Rabbit, so what are you going to do next year? <laughs> and Rabbit said, man, I'm going to be a pro surfer, mate. And uh, I went, wow, pro surfer, mate. And... Uh, I went with him. <laughs> so that was um, kind of a like a formative moment that, wow, pro surfer, you, you know, there was something there. And if Rabbit could do it, I could do it. So I, I think in some ways that he influenced me. And then, you know, the pro circuit started. Um, I won in 1977. PT won the first year, 76. It was kind of a retroactive thing. But anyway, PT won 76, 77. Uh, I won the like the first traveling year of the tour. Uh, the, the first year where everyone who started competing knew there was world title at the end of it, as opposed to '76, where it kind of got cobbled together at the yeah. end. And yeah, right. But still, you know, '76 was was the first first legit year, and uh, the first event of the year was held at Burley Heads, the first time we'd ever competed man on man in perfect four to six foot surf. You know, put together by that genius. Peter Drone and that, that that kind of changed surfing. You know, suddenly we went from from uh, it was the first time we had a decimal ten point scoring system. It was like twenty points. It was all these different systems. They called it the objective system, points for maneuvers. But this was so there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, that very first event of the tour year in nineteen seventy seven was 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 like a was like a pivotal year, and then uh, seventy eight. Um, I didn't have a very good year on the tour. I think I ended up uh, somewhere in the top six. Uh, can't remember exactly. What do you when. think the difference was? I'm just curious because I, I, I did, was it a little bit of a world title hangover, but figuratively speaking, or was it just just things didn't bounce your way in '78? I think uh, I sort of lost focus, and what also happened was the twin fin came. Mm-hmm. And I didn't jump on the twin straight away. So consequently, I got my ass handed to me by Mark Richards. Um, and it was like 
my surfing in surf from six feet up was still cutting edge, progressive, um, still you know one of the top guys in the world. But Mark had the acceleration, had the speed, had the had the power in in, in smaller waves. So I think that amp- impacted me, and uh, I kind of got disillusioned. Seventy nine. The first half of seven, I bailed out the tour. It was the first time in my life. I bailed out on the tour and went, ah, no, I'm going to go and do something else. And I went and I enrolled at acting school in the, in Hollywood. And I was there for like months. And I came like, eventually I just went, no way. This is not for me. <laughs> Packed my bags and I jumped back on the tour. The tour was in Japan. Jumped back on the tour and I never left it until I retired. Um, at the end of uh, 1989, and I was full on, full on from then onwards. And I had to discover, like, how can I generate, in- how can I generate an income from the tour? Sponsors were small. My principal sponsor at the time was O'Neill Wetsuits. So I started Instinct um, in 1980. Uh, Instinct started rocking, sponsored Tom Carroll to two world titles in 1984 and 1985. They just beat me in 1985 at the end. <laughs> uh, sponsored Barton Lynch to a world title in uh, 1988. So it was wonderful to to figure out yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a pro surfer, start a company, uh, and uh, and that's what I did. I, create, I, I, I sort of pulled the business and and the pure love and stoke together and merge it together. And, and I think both of them uh, impacted each other in a, in a positive way. It's interesting that, 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 that maps very closely to when I was talking to PT because PT was kind of like, Oh, you know, I did the tour, but like, we didn't think it was a thing that you would do for more than a couple of years. He's like, so I went to Hollywood, you know, because we had to build careers, which seems like such a stark contrast to today where young surfers develop and they're looking at this, ideally, like a stable championship tour platform. And they look at someone like Kelly Slater, who's still there at 50 years old. And they're like, if I want, I can do it forever. But that must just stand in very stark contrast to what it was early on, where you probably thought, this will be fun for a few years. I hope I do it right. But I got I to figure out how to pay a mortgage here at some point. Yeah, we had to figure it out, and uh, yeah, that was a, when I think about it now. You know, it was a, it was a lot of fun uh, figuring it out. I mean, it was just an idyllic existence, traveling the traveling the world, surfing the best ways, working with the w- working with uh, great people, building the sport, um, and then. You know, it, it's it's funny. I've always been a very um, I don't know if am, yeah, ambitious. I suppose is the right word. Very ambitious about trying to create. Uh, love to create things. You know, even when I after I retired from um, from the pro tour and sold Instinct, started another brand with my wife called Solitude, and then I started writing books. I made Bustin' Down the Door. Um, you know, going back to university, speaking in front of massive uh, audiences and continuing, you know, writing books and writing articles. It's, it's really fun to, to create something from nothing. Um, you know, it's like if you, you look at, you look at a beautiful wave. I mean, I love to look at empty waves. And then I look at the same way with a surfer on it doing something amazing. It's, he's added something beautiful. Mm. Um, And for me, there's always been this quest in my surfing to, to do something different, to do something beautiful. Like in my tube riding, you know, when I had a, when I started exploring tube riding at the Bay of Plenty, and then I took it over to backdoor pipeline off the wall, my, my approach was my own. It was unique. It was authentic. It was creative, expressive. But man, it was radical too. You know, I, I, 
I, I, I knew I created lines and, and rode that rode how it hadn't been ridden before. And, and, and that's when I, when I look for the best service in the world today and I look and I go like, the different line, the, the, the different style, the, the extra bit of imagination, like what are, you, what are you bringing to it? You're not a competitive machine, you know, it's not, you don't win, you don't win, you don't influence and inspire by being a competitive machine. It's like you influence and inspire with your art. Mm. I'm so glad you brought this up because I was going to go there too. But um, famously, if, if you get a few drinks in me, I will go on a very similar rant about um, surfing. Is my my theory is you know the ocean. I would argue is the most uh, alien environment for human beings on the planet. We're not <laughs> supposed to be there, and and surfing happens not only in the most alien environment on the planet, but arguably at the most violent, right? Where the, the land meets the sea. And surfers, especially surfers at a very high level, not only have to survive in that environment, but thrive. A and I think that it creates a, a, a psychology in people that do it or, or, or attracts that kind of person who just loves boundless creativity. And I'm so glad you brought up your tube writing because I was going to say the same thing, whether it's your recent work in speaking engagements or authoring books or creating companies or create or being one of the pillars of the creation of professional surfing. And even before that, innovating at some of the most dangerous waves in the world, a new way to ride. It feels like you, gra you as Sean Thompson gravitate towards those spaces where you can do something that has not been done before, which is kind of what I was trying to talk about before, where it's like, it feels like you and some of your contemporaries, especially, are moving into that space all the time. You're trying to find a space where I, I can do something new. Yeah, I think you always want to push it. I mean, I, I think I've always, you know, I think back to when I was riding pipe in the 70s, man, through into the 80s, just like pushing it, but not pushing it in the in the sense of, from like a macho perspective. I never thought mm. of this sort of macho testosterone vibe. It was just quiet courage, commitment, and confidence. It was that type of flow. Um, but, you know, I, I think I think as, a, as an athlete, um, like when I retired, I had the longest career when I retired. Of course, Kelly's broken every record known to mankind, but I, 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 uh, I was on the tour for 16 years. I mean, I actually surfed my first pro contest in 69. I surfed my last pro contest in 1989. Um, so I had, a, I had a long, long time of competing and making a living from from going surfing. Um, but I was always open to learn. Um, I think I always, you know, there's many lessons that one can learn from, from surfing. And, and I think humility is one of them. It teaches most of us, most surfers, it teaches us this, this humility. I mean, you think you got it down, you paddle out, and you get destroyed by the next wave uh you know you have this you, know, you paddle out in that vast sea you just feel small and insignificant you know you have this humility and, and to learn you have to be humble so i've always liked being focused on like how can i be better how can i learn what what can i what can i do and this philosophy is at the core of human purpose so over COVID and before, I asked people to write the code. So your code is your purpose. Twelve lines. Every line begins with our will. People think a purpose is an ethereal concept. Purpose is not an ethereal concept. Purpose is committed intention to create something meaningful for yourself and for others. It's it's purposes. Purposes commitment. 
So I get people to write their code, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. I will have faith. I will pray. I will, you know, everyone writes 12 different lines. But those 12 lines that are done in a 15 or 20 minute exercise represent a collection of purpose taken, taken together. So when you look deeper into what people write, and I've read over a million lines of code because I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, everyone only writes two lines. So a life purpose can be identified by two lines of code, which every athlete knows at their core. They know one line. Maybe they don't know both of the lines. But, but for me... I have flowed down these two rivers of purpose. So the one line everyone writes is, I will be better. We all have this genetic compulsion to be better. As an athlete, especially as a pro, you want to be better. You, know, you want to be better tomorrow than you are today. You want to be better today than you are. You know, have this genetic compulsion to be better. But if you want that process to have meaning, um, beyond just self-interest. The other line of code that people write is I will help others be better. So in everyone's 12 lines, there are those two statements. I'll be better, I'll help others be better. And I ask people to read it. I ask people to read it and they send it to me and, and you can see. That's our life purpose. I'll be better, I'll help, I'll help others be better. And it's nice to see that um, that athletes, just by inspiring, because it's the fundamental goal of a pro athlete, is that, to inspire. It's not to win, it's to inspire. Uh, yes, to inspire through winning, but it's to inspire. You want to lift people up. So the best guys, I think, are... Um, are doing that, they're, they're inspiring and ultimately they're helping others to be better. I love it. When you decided to leave the tour, you know, having accomplished all that you had, you know, um, redefining <laughs> forehand tube writing uh, at one of the most dangerous waves on the planet, winning a world title. Don't know. forget about the backside tube writing. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. I, I'm joking. I, I'm, I think you had 16 elite tour wins in your career, which is incredible. I, I, I will pause for a second there too, because I'm always amazed because there's so many people in the world that surf, so many people in the world that surf very well, but then that group gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you matriculate through the system. And for even as good as every single surfer that's ever qualified for the championship tour has ever been, such a tiny percentage have ever even won one event, let alone be so dominant win 16. Um, having ridden that high for as long as you did on the, the elite tour, did you find it personally difficult to retire and step away? You know, I think for some guys it's incredibly difficult. Um, I had a, a couple of things going for me. One was I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. And I planned it. So I wasn't squeezed out of the tour. It wasn't like as I was getting older, my results were getting worse and I got squeezed out of the tour. I still felt in my last event of the year at Sunset Beach, I remember I thought, I mean, I can win this event. Um, so I, I retired when I was still capable of winning events. Um, also, I made a firm decision. I wasn't going to look back over my shoulder. When I was done, I was done. And my plan then was go back, finish my university degree because I, I still had three credits outstanding. So I was going to go back and finish my economics and uh, business, business administration degree. Um, and then I had instinct. Um, 
in the end, it didn't work out with Instinct because I, 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 I retired from the tour, went back to university, had a fallout with my partners, uh, sold Instinct. The day I came home to tell Carla, listen, I'm selling out of Instinct, she said to me, well, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite a it was quite a momentous time, but I never looked looked back over my my shoulder, and you know I, I've created a life about f- from really looking deep into surfing and looking below the surface, and as surfers, you know when we ride that way, we just look ahead, we're looking in front of us, we're not we're not looking behind and we're not focused on like where we've come from. In fact, some waves that all of us as surfers have had, you get this amazing wave that's mind-blowing and you kick out and you can't even remember the ride. It's just like it was so exhilarating that it's been, it's just gone from your consciousness. So I think we always look forward. We have that hopeful nature. We have that um, optimistic nature, and I really, really got in touch with that um, when I retired. And I was going, okay, now I'm going to find another wave, and I'm going to paddle back out again. And 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 I did. I created a couple of new companies, sold them, went to work for Patagonia. You know, I'd never worked for anyone in, in, in my life. I worked there for a couple of years. It was an amazing experience, learning about how business can be can be a force for good um, and then you know losing my my uh, creating solitude building up solitude selling it and then losing my son and having to take a completely new life um, path and you know h- how can I use what I've learned and how can I use how I've suffered uh, to help others? So that's that, that's what I do now, and, and I, I got to tell you, Dave, this is such a satisfying part of my life. I love I love it. I love speaking to thousands of people. I love showing people the code. I love getting letters back from people. I lost fifty pounds as a result of doing the code method. My relationship with my son's better. You've given me hope. I'm going to live another day. I've changed my life, um, and. Surfing gave me this code. Man, I created this code when the ex-founder of Surfrider phoned me up and said, Sean, Rincon's facing a severe environmental challenge. I need you to inspire a group of kids. Give them some. You've got a $100 budget. I'm bringing kids to the beach. Inspire the kids, and I'm going to bring the media as well. And I wrote down the surface code, 12 lines, every line beginning with I will. I will always paddle back out. I'll never turn my back on the ocean. Just simple lines of metaphor and um, so surfing has surfing has given me a surfing has given me a, a laugh. It's given me a creative pursuit. Um, surfing has 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 given me so much, and I'm so 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 grateful. Beautiful. We're going to take one more break. Sure. And we'll be right back. Yeah, just before we went to break, you, you spoke so beautifully of the purpose you've found in your life post professional surfing career. Um, and and while, yeah, I, I agree, I, I, I obviously surfing has given you a lot of tools to do that, but it does seem like a lot of your experiences outside of surfing too allowed you intellectually, experience wise, to do what you're doing. And, and when you and I connected for, for this podcast, it was, you just released your latest book, um, Surfer and the Sage, uh, co-authored with, uh, Noah Benche. It's actually my, my wonderful neighbor, uh, Greg Harrison was the one that brought it up and I said, Oh good. I've been looking for a reason to, to talk to Sean. This is going to work out really well. And you sent it to me. I was able to mow through it. You write, uh, beautifully, but, but, but tell the listeners, how how this book with Noah Benche kind of came into being? So just before COVID, uh, a mutual friend of ours said, hey, I've got to get you guys together. So we went and had lunch, Noah and myself. We just met for lunch. And he told me, 
you know, what he was doing with his life. And I, I told him a bit about myself. And within 10 minutes, he turned around to me. He said, hey, Sean, let's write a book together. And I said, cool, we'll call it The Surfer and the Sage. And he said, a guide to survive and ride life's waves. That's how it quickly came together. It came together in like 10 minutes. And then uh, we wrote it through COVID. So a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the chapters were informed by what was happening in COVID. It was informed by what I was seeing in the world. I told you I would see that sad mindset, stress, anxiety, depression, and disconnection. And the, the book is a way to use surfing metaphor as a way to help people uh, perhaps have a different perspective. Uh, it's not a prescription, this book. And um, to show people this code method, this simple open source code that I developed, uh, how to use it with friends, with family, with perhaps colleagues um, at work. So the book has come from a, from a very pure place, like how can the two of us, Noah is, a, I think he's written 18, you know, his books have sold 18 million copies and like 30 books, I think he's written. He's, he's, he's a Pulitzer nominated, he's a, scholar of theology. I mean, he's a very learned learned guy. So his voice and my voice are, are, are different. We wrote separately. We didn't write together, even though we live in the same town. I mean, I'd write something, he'd show it to me, he'd write something, show it to me. So, so there was some connectivity, but pretty much it was like we thought, I said to know, well, look, listen, how many chapters should we have? So the book is, is, is very faith-based. It's not Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, it's, but it's faith. Mm. It's, it's about faith, the connectivity that all of us have to higher power uh, and humility. So we thought that we'd use the book as like a little bridge between darkness and light, between um, positive and negative emotions. So we chose 18 because I said to him, is there like a, a number that has like a religious significance. He said, well, um, in Hebrew, every letter has a numerical equivalent. They call it gematra. And he said, we're going to have 18 chapters. I said, why 18? He said, because 18 represents chai, means life. So I went, well, that that's cool. And then we balance, you know, surfing the metaphor with the balance, we balance every negative with a positive. Mm. So anxious and calm, despair and hope, powerless and empowered. So the book is, is you know, a reflection of, of both the positive um, and the negative. Uh, but for me, one of the most important aspects um, of the book is... And, and, and I talk about it in, in quite a few chapters on, um, on how to use this code method, how to find purpose, how to find commitment. And I, I want to I read you, I just want to read you something from the book. This is the chapter on uncertain and committed. Mm. So, so for me, when I talk about uncertain, I, I really think of pipeline, you know, what it takes to ride Ends up happening. You've got to paddle over that edge with absolute commitment. Like in the surface code, I write, I will take the drop with commitment. But but here I write about commitment from a more uh, philosophical and literal sense. So I write, underlying all positive decisions in and out of the surf is commitment, our internal personal power that drives us to action. Commitment and purpose are twin forces that provide us the certainty to know that when that next wave comes, we will take off and not in sit and wait endlessly, paralyzed by uncertainty, by what might happen rather than what we will make happen. Finding purpose need not be complicated. It can be found through a simple 20 minute process of introspection, visualization and commitment called the code method. Pick up a pen, give yourself 20 minutes of quiet time and write 12 lines, each beginning with our will. This code is a way to find, refine, and define one's purpose. The code is 12 lines of absolute commitment. Commitment 
is a way to break through the bonds of uncertainty, a covenant with ourselves, a promise to be better and make others better, a call to action. Commitment to a better life is not difficult, and it starts with two simple words. I will. <laughs> I love that you read that passage because, um, you know, in my experience and fortunate experience getting to know you over the last 16, 17 years at this point, I am struck by how much you are committed to finding purpose and meaning and, and drawing that out of other people. And I'm curious, is that is that something that you feel like you've always had, that, that instinct since you were young, as opposed to, I think for a lot of us, I'll include myself in this group anyway, when you're younger, it's just kind of like, I'm not thinking about any of that. It's piss and vinegar and, and I am, purpose is being put upon me by whatever, society, school, sports, work, whatever. But then what I've had to wrestle with certainly in the last several years as you get older is like, okay, well now you're the adult in the room you actually have to parse like meaning. Why am I doing this? What What is this for? Why am I asking other people to do this? So I'm curious w- with regards to your own journey, was that something you were always aware of when you were younger or was it something that you came to as you kind of matured um, in your own life? You know, I think there was an element there. Um, I remember uh, I was 19 years old. I'd go around and talk at a school. And you know, when you're young- When you're 19. You're young, you know, I hate being in front of people. You know, it's like, you, like I wasn't, I wasn't sort of the most outgoing kid, but I did it because I thought, wow, this is a way to promote surfing. You know, and I, I wanted surfing to be, you know, taken more seriously. So th- there was an element there. I think um, through my career, when I was asked by Glenn Henning, who founded Surfrider Foundation, listen, we'd like you to be our first member, our first pro surf ambassador back in 1984. And he said, right, we need a poster. We need to get a photo of you, a poster. And I got a photo of doing a bottom turn at Pop. And he said, we need the copy for our first ad. And I wrote, do a good turn today. And, and perhaps that was a, sort of an, a more overt turn down that path and then I think writing the surface code when I wrote it for those kids at Rincon was another push down that direction and then deciding to to write a book about it um, but I think it really it all coalesced with the loss of my son I think that was a complete uh shake up and that turned my whole life upside down and that sort of devastation of the loss uh it was like it broke me uh and then i had to remake me uh, and i remade myself differently i think uh, and certainly you know there's elements of of helping others were there i'd help i'd help this wonderful a uh, young man in South Africa, Ernest Bongani in Corsi, through school and university. And, um, you know, so there, there, there was that there, but it wasn't like a, a life focus. Right. How can I influence and inspire others? How can I activate purpose in others so they can have a better life? How can I show them how to use this open source code? How can I show people how to use this tool? And, and, and follow their own path. Because when I lost my son, when my wife and I lost our son in, 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 in 2006, um, and I eventually went back to university, back to do my, my uh, um, master's, you know, I came across all these studies about choice many, many studies on choice and how the single biggest killer in America today, no one knows about it, uh, is poor choice. A million Americans die every year from poor choices, preventable deaths. It's the single biggest killer in the country. One million Americans die every year. And my, my beautiful son was part of that statistic. He played a deadly game that he'd heard about at school. And kids are still dying from this game called the choking game. But there's many, many 
um, choices that people make that end up in death. People smoke. 480,000 people died last year from smoking. People get involved with illicit drugs. 100,000 deaths from illicit drugs. Um, drunken driving. Uh, bad diet that results in cancers and obesity. So a million people out of the 2.4 million that die every year, it's a massive, massive, massive uh, issue. And no one, no one knows about it, but I know about it. And there's many other people like me that know about it, that have lost children, that have seen the result of poor personal decisions impacting life. So I'm going like, okay, maybe like my little method, my little intervention, that's what the psychologists call my, my process, they call it an intervention. Maybe my intervention can help someone. And by helping someone, I'm helping them. Hey man, I'm helping me too. Mm. I'm helping me give meaning to my life. I'm helping me give meaning to my son's loss. I'm helping me with a pure mission. I'm helping me be motivated. I'm helping me maybe drop a stone, create a ripple, build a wave, creating a, my own type of wave. And I'm saying, here's the system, here's the method. Maybe you can do it too. So I'm hoping to build this tribe, man, of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people writing their code, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. Finding that commitment, finding that purpose, finding the power to make a positive decision and think twice, think twice about that decision. And that's my life now. And I love it. I mean, it is uh, um, inspiring, uh, you know, even in preparing for today's conversation. You know, you mentioned having to, it broke you and you had to basically recreate yourself from nothing but but you would have had to have drawn on experiences before that you know and I, as, a, as a father of a beautiful eight-year-old daughter and eight-year-old son I, even trying to imagine what that would be like which is a horrific thing to imagine i i think i don't know if i would be able to recover at, ever right so so even getting to hear what you've done with that and how you're inspiring other people to take to take more control and take more empowerment in their own lives. Really amazing. No, thank you. But it's, it's tell you what, surfing is amazing. And surfing, without a doubt, was my path back. Surfing helped me. Surfing helped heal me. I, uh, I mean, after I lost uh, Matthew, I didn't go surfing for a long time. And a friend of mine kept phoning me up, hey, Sean, hey, Sean, you've got to come surfing, you've got to come surfing. And I went, no, 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 I don't want to surf. The stoke was gone, you know. And like I said, I was the most stoked person on the planet, I think. And uh, eventually <clears throat> I go surfing. A friend takes me surfing. He said, I'm going to take you to a break. Never surfed before. So he takes me to this place in Belito Bay. I'd surfed in Belito, but never this particular break. And we walked down these, these steps uh, and the surf's perfection is about three to four feet and I paddle out uh, and I'm very, uh, very distraught and I'm crying. And as I paddle out these waves, just like wash, it's amazing, they just like wash your tears away, paddle out. And as I'm paddling up, that beautiful African sun, it's just rising up through the ocean boiling up. It's beautiful. And I can just feel that Matthew's with me. And I catch a wave and it makes me feel a bit better. And catch another wave and it makes me feel a bit better. And I catch another wave and it makes me feel better. And then this is the power of surfing. So I paddle up to my mate. We were at school together, sat next to each other, for high school. And I say to him, hey, G, what's the name of this wave? He goes, it's Sunrise. And when I heard that, I went, wow, Sunrise. 
that's just emblematic of 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 where I am right now. You know, this is going to be a new sunrise for me, yeah. and it was, and it came through surfing. That's the power of surfing. Yeah, and and, and I think you know, whether people have the opportunity to surf or not, everyone has their own figurative version of surfing. Everyone can have it. You know, it might be rock climbing. It might be meditation. You yeah. know, it's, it's, I, I think everyone, I think that's the beautiful thing about it is like people can patch into their own thing that heals them. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's just surfing is the one that I chose or chose me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's what, that's, that's sort of the path that I follow. That's the way that, uh, that I ride. And, um, you, you know, you know what I found is that is that non-surfers love the surfing metaphor. They mm. love stories associated with surfing because the ocean is deep, the ocean is vast, the ocean's unpredictable, the ocean is scary. You know, waves of power. So um, people can can relate to that metaphor in a far more spiritual and poetic way than. Uh, this is how I won the Super Bowl, or this is, um, you know, how I won the NBA championship. It it it, it just has. It's less literal. It's less literal. Mm. It's way more metaphoric. It's way more. It's like when I when I tell a story because my when I do my presentations for people, it's very much story based. So it's almost like. I'm telling a fairy tale, but it's a real tale. It's a real story, but it's like, it's almost like a fairy tale. And, and, and sometimes when I'll tell these stories, and while I'm telling them, I've told them before, and it's almost like I'm standing outside my body hearing this story myself for the first time. It's a very surreal experience. Mm. Um, and you can see the people responding to to these stories. It's just like when I was young, I would respond to the stories, these stories of Homer and Odysseus and, and these stories of the wreckers and Devon and Cornwall and the sea and the poetry and and it's surfing is lyrical it's not like baseball football basketball and it will never be like football baseball basketball we are in our own world and it's a beautiful world and we must never try to be who we not I think in the context of like the WSL promoting sport, promoting athletes, it's we're we're on a we're in this a different plane, mm -hmm. a different plane of existence. It's not lesser, it's not superior, it's just different. I think that's beautifully put. What's next for Sean Thompson? Are you going to be writing more books? Are you going to be working on more films? What what, what have you got in the hopper? Yeah, I've got a couple of uh, film projects. I've got another book project more of a business type book um i'm launching a new um, app around the code method a way for people you know millions of people to access it and and use it to hopefully make themselves and make society better um and then uh, um, I've, um, I've got quite a few, uh, you know, new speaking engagements planned. I'm going to Australia for a series of events, which is going to be a lot of fun up on the Sunshine Coast in Sydney. Um, so I'm always, feels like I'm always super busy, <laughs> always, always super busy, always. Um, I don't know. I suppose I'm just driven to be busy. I like, I like to like do projects. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
Well, before we go, we uh, we did get uh, questions coming sure. in from our uh, social media. So for everyone that follows us on uh, Instagram and Twitter at, at the Lineup Pod, thank you for sending in uh, lots and lots of questions. But we uh, we whittled it down to three. The uh, the first question is from at Corey James Walker, who asks, "What inspired you to move to the United States?" You know, at the time. I didn't realize it, but that pencil box picture that I had in grade eight of this guy locked in at Hammond's Reef, I think that was something that seared into my consciousness. So maybe that was behind the decision to, uh, to move here. And, and I moved here like most people move to the United States for opportunity. Um, I loved South Africa. I loved my homeland. Uh, but I thought in the field that I was at, in the, the field of, um, of, of surf, because I was in the surf business then, this was way more opportunity for me and my little family. Makes sense. Uh, second question is from at Coco underscore, underscore Christ, who asks, what is the proudest moment you've had as an active member of the Surfrider Foundation? Uh, you know, going down to Orange County when they were trying to make this decision to put this toll road through trestles, um, and there were many different environmental groups there that, that and, and there was a whole lot of people that were paid by the, by the transportation corridor, um, but just to see the power that Surfrider had to mobilize this, this crew of people and to know that, man, I helped with this because 1984, they got family up and I, Glenn Henning and I wrote those words, do a good turn today and, and I dropped a stone, created a ripple and helped build that wave. Love it. Uh, last question that we uh, called from the uh, social media community is from at Andy Cashford, who asks, what is something you can only learn in the barrel of a wave? <laughs> There's two things, not one thing. <laughs> one, you learn that you can expand time. Two, you learn that you can curve that wall to your will. <laughs> that's a great answer <laughs> all right thanks to everyone that wrote in at, at the lineup pod we are now down to the final segment it is time for the lightning round 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can uh -huh. if you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life single fin twin fin thruster quad bonzer or finless which would you choose i'll go for a single Coffee or tea? Tea. Burrito or pizza? Pizza. Last book you read? Sorry? Uh, last book you read? Well, I've read it so many times, man, search for meaning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll work. Uh, best surf film ever? I would say free ride. Mm -hmm. One wave you never have to go back to? Pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> if you only get to surf one way for the rest of your life. Super tubes, J Bay. Best person to share a lineup with. Um my brother Paul. Worst person to share a lineup with. Ian cans because he always drops them in me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair answer. Uh, last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. By kissing my son. Sean Thompson, thank you uh, so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for um, your insight and your candor. 
Thank you for everything you've done uh, inside and outside the water in surfing. It's a true honor to sit here with you. Uh, everyone, be sure to check out Surfer in the Sage. Be sure to check out Busting Down the Door. Follow Sean. He knows what he's talking about. And uh, yeah, man, it was a real pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. I just love where the WCL is going, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thank you for having me on. Cheers.